there was an adult film festival that you, it was called the Hump Fest. <laughs> you know, you can't make this up, man. I mean, and so, yeah, for the people that are like, oh, well, you know, what's the Caleb, you know, verse of the day safe for the whole family? Like, I wasn't dealing with those people. I was not dealing with that. Um, they didn't show up in a minivan, yeah. you know. And so there was a Hump Fest, and the Hump Fest decided it was an amateur porn film festival in town and they didn't want people just putting in any old porn so you had to you had to qualify for the adult film festival so there every year they would decide you needed to have one of these few things in your film to prove that you made it from the hump fest and one of them one year was me mm. so like i had dudes humping in vans outside of my church trying to get me in the shot walking in <laughs> we had to do security sweeps we had dudes and hiding in the bathroom and I came home, I told my wife, this was a long, this was decades ago. I was like, baby, I got a lot of video on the internet. If some of that gets edited in, just know it ain't true. It ain't true. But Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Hafiz. And I know, I know I said it, but... Welcome back. As you guys know, I've recently shared how we're I've been transitioning from doing the roommates to now doing the standard. And I know that I've shared that the biggest thing for me was that I wanted to be able to do more things for an older demographic of men. And while I'm so grateful for all the time, energy, sacrifices, and time you guys invested in this channel, it was definitely my season to move on. But, but I realized something about a month into it that there was absolutely no way possible I could ever stop doing the podcast without bringing literally the person who made every single thing happen for a lot of you guys you know, who know my story knows that 19 years old i became a christian and i really started getting a passion a desire to be able to help transform the lives of men and for those who have seen my content enough you know that there's this guy <laughs> who i'm constantly quoting who was literally the genesis of all those things and some of you guys think is dr peterson which it is it is dr peterson but before dr peterson there was the guest who is joining us today on the podcast literally i kid you not guys i have probably consumed more content more sermons more videos from this man than any other human being on this planet started watching him when I was 19 years old. And there's so many things that if you hear me talk, I plagiarized by, from him. Mind you, I, I told him, I gave him credit all the time. So when I used to always say men are like a dump truck, they drive shutter with a heavier load, I got it from him. When I used to talk about how that a man needs to be tough and tender, I got it from him. Even the inappropriate jokes <laughs> that I love to share, I learned it from him. So mom, you ever want to know? This? I learned, no, my mom knew I had that problem before him. Um, and, and even temperamentally, I found that there was only one other person who I liked. So when you see me and I'm screaming at you guys, know that this guy was screaming at me first. I'll never forget the day. It was November 2010 and we I had just gotten back from the New Orleans Bowl and I was in my parents bed, um, living room I was lying on the couch listening to a sermon and I was listening to it like right when I was about to go to sleep and literally right when my eyes were closing this guy says who the hell do you think you are <laughs> and i was like whoa who, who, me and 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 just was preaching with so much, so much passion and zeal and i was like yo i am hooked and so literally my desire to help men was created because this man created content that transformed my life obviously it was god but God used him as well. And so literally the roommates 
grandfather <laughs> is this man who's going to be joining us today. So we're going to be talking about a lot. I promised my wife I wouldn't do most of the talking <laughs> and I'll let him talk. And without further ado, the the man who was on my Hall of Fame, my Mount Rushmore, the man who's impacted me, the man who's literally helped so many millions of guys and has transformed you guys' life through me, the one, the only, Pastor Mark Driscoll. I don't even know what to say, bro. I, I, I feel like now I'm just going to be a giant disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> there's an app, Pastor Mark, there's absolutely no way that's possible. Well, Thank you so much for joining me today. No, Pastor it's my Mark. honor. Thanks for coming to visit us in Scottsdale, man. No problem. No problem, Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark, we have a lot to talk about today. We're going to get into a lot of things. Um, there's a lot that I, 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 I want to hear you share about. Um, I know a lot of our audience not religious um so i feel like this is going to be a great opportunity um for them to to see why faith is so big in my life yeah um but 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 more than that pastor mark one of my biggest criticisms about the internet has been there's too many fictional characters there's too many guys who are wwe wrestlers and not mma fighters right they yeah. put on a facade they put on a character and they and and on top of that they're leading people the wrong way and the one thing that I can say from not only following you from afar, but seeing your content for decades of my life, you are the same exact man that you are on stage in person. And not only that, your life is such a testament to faithfulness. And I want to begin by telling you how grateful I am for you. I got to learn so much. You got to take a lot of arrows for me. And, and, and it's uh, beyond a privilege to be able to sit down with you today. No, it's an honor, buddy. I'm happy to do anything I can to try and be helpful, man. No problem, no problem. So I know who you are, Pastor Mark. So for our audience who, who don't know who you are, can you give them a bit of an elevator pitch synopsis about who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, going to turn 53 soon. Um, and so i uh, been married to my wife, Grace, for 31 years faithfully. We dated for about four years before we were married. I met her um, at 17 in high school. She was a pastor's daughter. I was a Jack Catholic kid. <laughs> and so uh, we started seeing each other. I started sleeping with a pastor's daughter. I mean, <laughs> dude, the fact I'm not on fire right now uh, is a miracle. And so I uh, went to college, first man in my, co my family to ever go to college. And uh, she gave me a Bible and I started reading it. And uh, I became a Christian reading the Bible. Uh, met with my pastor. He's like, you got to stop sleeping with her. I was like, dang. <laughs> so um, we stopped sleeping together. We ended up getting married in college. And then I graduated with a degree in speech. Uh, we got married uh, between my junior and senior year. Um, and then God spoke to me audibly. I was I probably, I think it was around 19, uh, same age as you became a Christian. I was just going for a walk and it was at a men's retreat. And I'm not a brand new Christian. Like all I know is like, I need to read the Bible and stop sleeping with a pastor's daughter. Mm -hmm. I basically got two things on my to-do list at that <laughs> point. And uh, God spoke to me audibly. He said, uh, Mary Grace, preach the Bible, train men and plant churches. He said four things. And he said one other thing. I don't know if I've ever shared publicly. He said, I've called you out from among many to lead men. Mm. I don't even know, I'm like 19, like yeah. I don't, I don't even know what that means. Wow. Um, met with my pastor, I was like, God spoke to me audibly. I didn't know he still did that. And he's like, well, that's what you need to do. So since that day, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Uh, to the best of my ability, sometimes successfully, sometimes mm -hmm. trip over my own feet in the red zone, <laughs> you know, but, um, and so now we've got five kids, uh, 17 to 25, 26, they all love the Lord. I've got uh, my son, who uh, my oldest daughter, she's due any week with my grandson, um, and she married a wonderful guy. They run Real Faith, and uh, and it's so great to see your daughter loved and safe and happy. Mm. It's the best thing in the world, and I can't wait to meet their kid. My next son, I'll do lunch with him after this. Uh, he's our student ministry director at the church. He loves Jesus. Married a gal he met at 14. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, they got married. They've got a beautiful little boy. Uh, they so met my, in high school? They met in, I think, middle school. Oh, wow. And then uh, he came home. He was like, Dad, I, I want to talk to you. I was like, okay, son. <laughs> He's like, I, I, I like somebody. I was like, 
okay. He's like, it's a girl. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're in Seattle, bro. You got to celebrate the win. You got to celebrate the win. I was like, I was like, he's like, I think this is my girl. I'm like, dude, 14. Like, yeah. you got two years before you can go pick her up. Like, you, you know, you got to wait. Yeah. But they, he fell in love, and they, they've just locked in his best friends ever since, and they serve Jesus, and uh, he'll be a pastor soon. He's a good Bible teacher, and then. My son, uh, who's 21, he's on his honeymoon right now oh, wow. to a wonderful gal. And then I've got a daughter who's awesome and in college, and my son is a senior in high school. So I started off as a single guy and then got married and then had kids, and now I'm kind of rounding the bases into being the father-in-law and being the grandfather. Yeah. And so we've got Real Faith, which is an online ministry uh, where we give away Bible teaching, and then I've got a local church that we planted as a church family. Uh, we planted as a family in Scottsdale, Arizona. So. That's me, man. I've been in the pulpit um, 30 years. Yeah. I've been a senior pastor like 28 years. Um, I started ministry immediately. I think I preached my first sermon a couple of weeks after I became a Christian. <laughs> it was not a good sermon. <laughs> it's not on the internet. It was it was craptastic. But I was trying. You know, I was trying. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's me, man. I'm a I'm a Bible teaching husband and father and pastor and grandfather that's me that's beautiful that's beautiful we'll, we'll get we'll get into all that and and to me i'm complimenting you a lot today pastor mark but um what i've always told people is that you can't fake it when your kids love you that's the one thing you can't fake you know yeah. your wife can maybe put on a facade to, for the, for public image you know yeah. and you know your, your your employees you can pay them off right but like you can't fake when your kids love you. And to me, like I said, literally remembering being 19 years old, listening to your sermon. I think what was your daughter like, what, like 12 at that time? You know, and it's like hearing how you were raising her. And now being 30, about to be 33, and it's like she's now about to be a mom. It's like he 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 did something right. And we'll we'll get into all that. So you started your you started being a pastor in 96? Yeah, I became a senior pastor. <clears throat> I think I became a senior pastor in 95 and and then uh, 95, 96, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know. Bro. Like I'm at the point now, like, yeah. I don't know, man, it's the 90s, you yeah. know, like yeah. I had bangs and hope, you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. so what, so were you 25 or 26 when you I first- I was 25 started? when I was a senior pastor. I, I became a college pastor, I think I was 22 when I first became a oh, pastor. Wow. So, wow. so I've been a pastor 30 years, I've been a senior pastor, I think 28 years, so something like that. Being a pastor at 25, what was that like? I didn't know what, dude. <laughs> it was not good. I, you know, I. Uh, there's God's will, and then there's God's timing. Mm, that's good. And as a young man, I was way more uh, excited about God's will than God's timing. <laughs> and so I would get ahead of His timing. And mm. so, for me, um, looking around, seeing a, you know, my we were in an environment where it was just all non Christians and punk rock kids, and this was the grunge era, and this was you know, uh, college students in downtown Seattle and and just the lostness. Yeah. And uh, I just thought, man, people need Jesus. I'm gonna go do something. But it would have been good for me to be more patient. Mm. It would have been good for me to choose a spiritual father and spent more time under him getting developed. Mm -hmm. And instead, I just, you know, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> I didn't quite get the sequencing yeah. right. Um, but yeah, at 25, I did the best I could. But I, if I would have had a, if I would have had more patience and submitted to a spiritual father, I think I would have saved a lot of errors. Mm. And so for me, I, I got a communication degree before the internet, mm -hmm. which is insane. <laughs> and then, um, and so for me, we were, I was one of the first pastors to have a website and give away sermons, and and we were one of the first to video, and we were always kind of on the, I was always on the leading edge of platforms. Yeah because I just wanted to get Bible teaching out. But that means that my whole career has been public. Yeah. And there's a downside of that. You mm -hmm. know, we're seeing that now with like t childhood stars in Disney. It yeah. usually doesn't end well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I don't know what Britney Spears is doing today, but I'm praying for her. You know? <laughs> um, and so for me, like it's a good thing if you can have some privacy as a young man to get your reps and make your mistakes. Yeah. I just lived it all very openly and publicly, and I've kind of just been living publicly since my 20s. Yeah. So for the people who don't understand, you were a pastor in Seattle, Washington. Yep. 
And so people can get an idea. Is it is it safe to say Seattle in 96 was like America today? Totally. No. And, and what happens is, so Europe is ahead of America as far as progressivism and socialism and liberalism and stupidism. <laughs> and then what happens is uh, Canada would be just a half a step behind. Mm. And so if you're in a Seattle or a New York um, or even if you're in a Toronto or Vancouver, you're usually about a generation ahead. Um, and then what happens is eventually um, what happens in the major blue dot cities on the college campuses finds its way into mainstream culture. And so if you want to know what the future looks like, go to a bright blue dot and walk onto the university campus and see what those kids are being brainwashed in. They're going to graduate. They're going to set laws, culture, entertainment, and politics. And in a generation, what they're experiencing on campus is going to be normative culturally. Mm. And so I got saved in college and I started in college what ministry. What college was it, Washington? I went to, uh, I got a degree from uh, the Edward R. Murrow School of Communication at Washington State University, yep. speech degree. And then I went to Western Seminary. I got a master's basically in Bible. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So, yeah. And so ultimately, you know, I started um, trying to reach people that the typical church is not built for. Yeah. And so things today, people are like, oh, my gosh, transgenderism. I had my first dude show up in church in a dress <laughs> asking which restroom to use in like 97. <laughs> like 97. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so today people are like, like, no, I mean, yeah. the dude now is like probably a great grandpa, you know, like, and so, you know, in certain places, yeah. what's normal eventually works itself out. So yeah. right now in Alabama, there's dudes walking around in dresses, but in places <laughs> like Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA, they've been walking around in dresses since the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really important to your story because to me, I think what I would always tell people, or I think people misunderstood, especially they like. I feel like you were a prophet outside your time in the like uh, like 2010 or 2012, like 2008 to 12 kind of era because it was like everybody was still enjoying the the, the last times of the Bible Bible Belt, right? Yeah. And there was still this like veneer of like, oh yeah, it's America's a Christian society, right? And and you were literally like in America in 2035 back in you know, yeah. Seattle in the, during that period of time. And it was a whole different world. Just so, so people can get an idea of what the church was like. Was there not like this adult film convention that used you as the theme yeah, or like bro, I, I have had a, a, a wonderfully weird life just strange things like I'll never forget like uh, there was this uh, gay um, magazine that and they or newspaper and I was going into a burger joint one of my sons was little and he's like dad how come you're on the cover <laughs> and I was like I was like yeah, what I look it was it was a parody column they they used my photo and they were pretending to be me oh my god writing uh pro gay editorials and uh and I had people in my church leave and they're like I can't believe you're pro gay I was like dude like I have better chance of being pregnant than gay like you know like I'm not gay like but and then there was uh there was an adult film festival that you, it was called the hump fest I'm, you know you can't make this up man I mean, and so, yeah, for the people that are like, oh, well, you know, what's the Caleb, you know, verse of the day safe for the whole family? Like, I wasn't dealing with those people. I was not dealing with that. Um, they didn't show up in a minivan, yeah. you know. And so there was a hump fest and the hump fest decided it was an amateur porn film festival in town and they didn't want people just putting in any old porn so you had to you had to qualify for the adult film festival so there every year they would decide you needed to have one of these few things in your film to prove that you made it for the hump fest and one of them one year was me mm. so like i had dudes humping in vans outside of my church trying to get me in the shot walking in <laughs> we had to do security sweeps we had dudes in, hiding in the bathroom and I came home, I told my wife, this was a long, this was decades ago. I was like, baby, I got a lot of video on the internet. If some of that gets edited <laughs> in, just know it ain't true. It ain't true. But now with the deep fakes, like I'd be, I'd be stressed, man. I'd be stressed. And so, yeah, I mean, this has just been my, yeah. this has just been my, my weird life, man. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, it, it's not boring. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but stuff like that. Like yeah. where we had, where I, where I used to preach, down the street, they had the statue of Lenin yeah. when communism fell. 
and they had it on CNN. They showed the statue of Lenin falling. Mm -hmm. That town bought it. Oh my god! <laughs> imported it and put it in front of a Taco Del Mar. <laughs> So if you want to go get a taco, oh you needed to God. go visit Lenin because they loved him. Yeah. And then they had the solstice parade, which was uh, led by a nudist bicycling team. <laughs> like, And the, kid, the people bring their kids out. Yeah. And the dude who led it, he would wear a loincloth <laughs> and a big afro. And he would sing old school like Motown songs. He got saved, became one of our worship leaders. Oh, wow. So, dude, that's where I'm at. Like yeah. Mardi Gras meets, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know, just reality television <laughs> yeah, show, yeah, yeah, just yeah. craziness. But to me, like, that's where I grew up. Yeah. And that's where I was from. And that's where we started. Yeah. And so for me, like, um, Christians have always felt like, well, I, I've gotten criticism from some because it's like, man, you know, what you say doesn't necessarily speak to me. It's like, I, well, there's already voices that'll speak to yeah, you. Yeah. I'm trying to speak to those people that nobody's been able to get to them yet because because the frequency hasn't been dialed in, yeah, especially yeah. men. And my heart has always been for young men. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want to, I want to love and serve everybody. But you know, when I was younger, I tried to be a brother as I got a little older, tried to be a big brother and now try to be a good father to yeah. a generation of young men. Just try and help. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And, and, and there's so many stories that we can get into. Um, so I want people to understand this is the backdrop of what's creating um, pastor Mark today. And so, Mar Mars Hill became a mega church. When, was that like 30, you were 31, 30? Like Dude, you know more about me than I do. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I just the pastor Mark historian. <laughs> I just get up, yell, come home, kiss Grace, get up the next day and yell. I just yeah. been doing this since yeah. the 90s, man. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I started into ministry in the first three years. I was an unpaid volunteer dealing mainly with college kids. And next thing you know, they start getting saved. And and like even now, we moved to Arizona and we started a church as a family. And like, you know, we have more people than seats and parking. And <laughs> I think we baptized 100 last weekend oh, wow, and awesome. just last weekend. So yeah. like for me, like, I don't know, man, like I just get up and go. Yeah. And then people get saved and things happen and yeah. people are like, how'd you do? Like, I didn't. And I don't know. I don't understand. Like, yeah. I'm a kite in a hurricane. <laughs> I'm not a hurricane. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. The, the reason why I asked is because like, to me, what I've, what I've seen from your story, I remember somebody once said, don't let like, like you're like, basically your, your gifting and your skills and, and, and the blessings of God gave you an overwhelming opportunity that most people don't get until their fifties and sixties. So there, there's this overwhelming, like, like responsibility that I think most men today, like you joke around trying to like figure life out, but you were literally shepherding, which is totally different than any other job thousands upon thousands of people in your late 20s early 30s and so one of the things that i absolutely loved about your ministry today um and even in the past was that i was so blown away by the idea that you were a pastor in seattle the least church city in america you in portland would obviously go back and forth here and there mm -hmm. and your biggest demographic was young men between the ages 18 to 35. I don't think people understand what that even means. That is the least church demographic in the country, mm -hmm. was your largest demographic in your church, in the least church city in America. And so obviously, Pastor Mark, it was God. It was the Holy Spirit. It was a, a miracle. But in your opinion, what caused so many young men who are everything but church to want to come and be a part of what you were doing. Yeah, and what's weird is <clears throat> it's only it's only increased. Mm. So today, the large the, the lion's share of my followers, I'm I'm told online. Um, I don't follow a lot of that to be honest with you. Um, I try to just pray and hike in the woods and listen and then say what I'm supposed to say. Is young men. Mm. And uh, I have seen what's really weird. I, I don't even understand it. Um, half of my social media and followers online came uh, from 1996 to 2022. The other half came this year. Mm. So I've, I've doubled the the life's work has doubled this year, yeah. which is bizarre. 
and it's mainly young men. Yep. And the largest demographic is young men. Mm. And so most of my social media followers on most of the platforms are men and young men. Most of my live streams are men and young men. And even like tonight, we'll kick off real men for, uh, it's a Bible study I do at our church every week. We had to go to two nights because the men don't fit in the building. Mm. And uh, doing a series just called Dominion for Dudes. And I'm talking about being under God's dominion and then exercising your dominion as a man. And I don't know, three, four, five hundred thousand guys will tune into the live stream. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Like, um, I have always just somehow communicated to the hearts of men. Yeah. And, um, and I thank God for that. And it's not something that I understand. So, like, even um, when I speak to men and stuff, like, usually... I'll just take a few minutes, pray, write a few things down, get up in verbal process. Yeah. There's just some, there's an anointing there that I don't understand. Yeah. And somehow I can speak to men and they receive it. Yeah. And I don't, um, I don't take any credit for that. I don't understand that, but I'm super grateful for it because I think the culture that we live in has been uh, custom architected to break young men. Mm. I think that the world that we live in is not an accident. I think it's it's a malicious, nefarious agenda to break young men. Yeah. And it's being incredibly successful from uh, men not in the labor force, men not in church, men not in college, men not launching, men not moving out of their mother's home, men not marrying, men not fathering their own children. What you're seeing is the least impressive statistical generation of young men in the history of the United States of yeah. America. Uh, they're a damn joke, but it's not funny. Mm. And so, but God made them for greatness. Mm. And Paul says uh, that that man is the glory. The man is the glory of God. And so, when you reach in and you just tell a guy, "Hey, man, you were made for more. You're capable of more. You're built for more." Um, there's something that awakens in that guy yeah. because all he's been told is that, uh, you know, he's a problem, not a solution. The yeah. truth is he's a solution if he gets it right. Mm. You know what I think it is, Pastor Mark? I think it's one of two things. I think in a place that lacks masculinity, men yearn for it. And you build for it. You drop a fish in water and they're like, oh, this feels like home. <laughs> you know, you drop a man in a masculine environment, not not angry, not domineering, not overbearing, not not Andrew Tate, you know, <laughs> not just a, a thug, but a man who um, who knows when to be tough and when to be tender. And he knows when to fight and he knows just when to serve. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you've got for the first time in America's history, the majority of children are growing up in a home without their father if their mother is 30 or younger. Mm. So you've got a whole generation of guys and all the statistics latest say that masculinity is a trait learned from your father. Mm. You learn mannerisms, you learn disposition, you learn masculine, right, healthy, masculine aggression by having a father around. Mm. And there's a whole generation that's been over mothered, under fathered. Yeah. And, um, and, and the result is, you know, I always like to say, we need more fathers and less government. Because yeah. if, if the men don't fill the gap, then the government does. Mm. And all the government does is just breaks men. That's all it does. And it creates dependence for women and children. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's brilliantly put, Pastor Mark. And I, and I think the second thing that you do a fantastic job, and I'm not even sure you even realize that you do this, is that you sell men a dream and a vision. I think that's something that I like. I was asking myself, I was like, what what draws me to the message? Because I think, you know, society, as you always talk about, treats men like a pinata, right? They just pro make fun of Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin, like they like to make fun of men, kind of be little men. And and you do give men harsh words because, you know, it's needed at times. You say something like harsh words create soft hearts. Yeah, strong words produced, uh, well, hard, hard words produce soft people, soft words produce hard people. Exactly. And that, and you've got a whole, you've got a whole world where it's like, I got a participation trophy. <laughs> so you were built for greatness. Yeah. I mean, you know, just breathing and fogging a mirror is not, is not the end zone. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think when you like give men that vision, like I remember one time you were going on a tangent about video games, you know, and just talking about video games aren't simple, it's just stupid, you know, and yeah. then all of a sudden, but then you gave a, a, a vision for what life can be 
outside the video game. You know, if you want a dragon, there's this dragon here. If you want this princess, and you and you sold this vision for a greater future than what you're currently living today. And I think what's going on in society is that society is selling men a, a neuter dream. And there's some guys who are like, uh, it's just something's in their spirit. It's just like, that's that's not right. But there's no one else yeah. giving a, a counter message. And and I see that like your message was always something proactively that men are aspiring to be like, oh, like that's what I was called to be. And it's like resonating with my soul. Well, and, and part of it is, I mean, we're Christians. Not everybody watching is like, you know, God looked at the world, said it's broken and there's a problem. So I need to figure out what the solution is. And his answer was, I'm going to become a man. Mm. That must mean that the most powerful thing on the earth is men. Mm. You know, and so if God's going to become a man, now we know what a man is supposed to look like and what he's supposed to do. Yeah. And so for me as a Christian, like you can't, if you want to be a man, you better figure out what the prototype is. And his name is Jesus. Yeah. You know, and and for me too, like um, I think men need vision. And what you get, I mean, it was just so devastating. I mean, right now we've got with COVID lockdowns. I mean, the vision that our government gave young men was go home, don't get married, don't launch, uh, don't start a business, don't marry a woman, don't have a child, just sit on the couch, play video games, vape, you know, <laughs> have date night with pornography, and uh, the government will put money in your account. You yeah. don't even need to go to the to the mailbox to get the check because we'll just do a, a direct deposit. Yeah. And it's like, damn it, you just broke a whole generation of men. Mm. You know, you just took away all of their incentive because, you know, this world is built by men who have a wife and kid to feed. Mm. That's what built this world. Mm. And if you take away men with a responsibility to feed their wife and children, the entire economy and culture collapses because wow. it's only held up by men who are motivated to love their wife and kids. Mm. Man, who says with something to lose. I remember you, you you shared in the sermon series how in Ephesus, was it Ephesus when they went to war? Was that Gal when they Galatia. went to Galatia, it was Galatia, they went to war and they would bring their, their family. Wife and kids. Wife and kids to the front. You would kiss your wife and kids and then you would go to war. Yeah. And it was like, either I'm gonna kill that guy or tonight he's gonna get my wife. Yeah, yeah. And you fight differently Yeah. when you fight for your family. You work differently when you work for your family. And there is something profoundly honoring to come home from work at the end of the day as a man and your wife smiles and welcomes you, your kids run up and greet you, and you sit down at the dining room table and you realize I'm taking care of them mm. and they're safe because yeah. of me. Yeah. There's something in a man that that is what God made him to be and do. Mm. And when he does that, it's hard, but there's a profound sense of joy. That's beautiful. And so I think one of the other challenges that, I, that I, I've noticed and which I, I love you for is that when you're a man who's going to talk to men, who's going to speak to men, who's going to try to help men, who wants to do God's work, obviously there's a huge target that's not only on your back, but it's also on your chest. And 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 for so many men, there's that fear of like, man, like if I speak up, if I do this, if I do that, man, I'm, they're gonna beat me like a pinata like they did Pastor Mark. They're gonna do this, that, and third. So to you, when you hear people like say that, man, there's, if I speak up, if I talk about these things, I'm going to get attacked. What makes you, in the midst of all the difficulties, still persevere and stay true to the message in spite of what society does and says about you? I stop caring. Yeah. Not about people, but about their opinion. When? Um, I was some years ago. <clears throat> the nice thing is I got my cancel card punched about 10 years ago. Yep. And so now I'm in zombie mode. <laughs> I'm already dead. You can't scare me. You can't scare me. Um, and at the end of the day, um, I was kind of having a pity party for one, like God, you know, why am I in this difficult season and being falsely accused and some things, 
everything that's said. You know, some is true, some is partly true, some is entirely untrue. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, why don't you sift it out? It's like, well, it's for the same reason when I go to the zoo and all the monkeys are flinging poo, I'm not trying to <laughs> sort it into piles. I'm just going to go home. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember I was talking to the Lord, and uh, he always calls me son. And so whenever the Lord speaks to me, he calls me son. I said, you know, Father, why? Why, why am I going through all this, man? I was in my 40s and, uh, you know, had resigned my job, lost my platform. I was locked out of all my social media accounts, didn't even have my passwords really? to defend myself for, yeah, for at least six months. I exited social media for 18 months. I'm in my 40s, five kids, pickets, protests, death threats, people at my house. My kids are having trauma and trying to deal with all the fear and, and I'm like, God, why? And, and I remember the Lord spoke to me. He's like, son, you gave me your sin. Why won't you give me your reputation? Mm. I was like, okay. Mm. And I'll tell you, man, it's easy to give the Lord your sin because you don't want it. <laughs> but it's hard to give me your reputation because wow. you do. Wow. And so I was like, okay, you can have my reputation too. Mm. And so I, uh, I know I'm not always right, <clears throat> but when I fail, I will fail falling forward. Mm. I will not fail falling backward. What do you mean by that, Pastor Mark? I, I don't have a reverse gear in my life. Mm. You know, even if even if I miss the shot, I will take the shot. Yeah. Even if I lose the fight, I will be in the fight. Mm. And so for me, God built me for war. Yeah. And um, I don't understand it. I yeah. think I have a, by God's grace, I've got a pretty high pain tolerance. And I think that your pain tolerance determines your leadership lid. Mm. So if you want to have more influence, you need to endure more pain. So you don't fall in the midst of difficulty. Exactly. So like I was, uh, I was reading a book um, on world-class athletes, guys that are in the Olympics and guys that, you know, are kind of that next level. This is good. All of them, it said in this study, had one thing in common. At some point in their life, they have profound trauma and deep loss. Mm. And they push through it and they increase their pain threshold. Mm. And so they, the, the clinician literally said their training was in their trauma. Mm. So you got a whole generation today, they're like, I've had hardship or trauma, which they haven't. Like <laughs> if somebody, you know, misgenders your pronoun, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. not a trauma victim, yeah. you're, you're, you're a baby. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But if you, if you push through it, what it does, God uses the adversity to strengthen you. Mm. And so, you know, the world-class athletes, they're like, I can keep going because I know how to push through pain and increase my pain threshold. And so the key for a man is this, always just pushing yourself to the very limits of breaking and then getting stronger. Yeah. But we live in a day when guys are over-mothered, under-fathered, path of least resistance, you know, and you've got a whole generation of guys that are like, I'm gonna live with my mom you know, and I'll drive Uber, and as soon as I make the eighty dollars I need for the day, <laughs> I'm going to go home and call it a day. It's mm. like, no, I, I, I want to see, I want to see what breaks me, mm. and then I want to heal from that, and I, I want to go further, and I want to have a heavier load. Mm. And so for me, it's I'm not, you know, the key as a man is you're not competing against other men. Every day you're getting up and you're competing against yourself. Yeah. It's like, what did God make me to, to, to be and to do? And where does my breaking point and what is my pain threshold and what is my responsibility level? And some guys would be like, well, what if you fail? You're going to. Mm. As a man, you will fail. Yeah. As a man, you will get fired. As a man, you will lose. As a man, you will get your teeth kicked in and you will swallow them. Mm. And then you will get up the next day and you'll fight through it. And once you overcome it, then you're going to be a man that other people respect. Yeah, that's powerful, Pastor Mark. Man, that's 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 really really good. And so, one of the things that you talked about briefly before we record is that you you've you've totally disconnected. Um, f um, you can't you can't listen to what everybody thinks about you. <clears throat> and that's where. So, you know, I'm old enough that uh, I remember when they started reality television mm -hmm. shows. And uh, I remember uh, I got to meet Mark Burnett. He was kind of the godfather of all the first reality television shows. And here's the truth about reality television. It's not real. Yeah. It's all staged. It's all choreographed. It's all nonsense. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, what happens is... Um, it, it, Dr. Drew Pinsky, I, I, I did Love Line with him some years ago. Was Adam Carolla couldn't yeah. make it, so they tapped me in. It was a weird day. 
I remember we're taking sex calls, me and Dr. Drew in LA, and I was like, what the heck? Um, and, uh, but he was talking offline, and he since wrote a book on it. It was called The Mirror Effect, and he was talking about how celebrities model, and then their followers mirror. Mm. And so what happens is, like, if that's why you have influencers, mm. and they have products or behavior or beliefs, and then what happens is, as soon as a celebrity models something, and then the followers mirror it, it's no longer interesting. So you need to keep mm -hmm. getting more bizarre, surreal, strange yeah. to keep yourself on a platform and growing. It's how we end up with the Kardashians. You're yeah. like, oh, boob job, boob job. Dad got a boob job. Yeah. Like, like, whoa, this would, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. is, you know, what's next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, did they have a beagle? And, you know, what are we going to do with that poor beagle? Yeah. You know, because you know, yeah. like, everybody in the house has to go through plastic surgery. And, yeah. and, and, but what it is then, it's continually determining what will get me fans and followers. Yeah. And what it is, it's worship. Mm. Because we were made to mirror and we're made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. And if we don't mirror God, we That's mirror good. someone or something else That's and it good. becomes a counterfeit. So yeah. for me, you will absolutely poison your soul if you, if you say or do or have or believe something and then you worry about what the response will be and then you change based upon the response. in order to get yeah. a better or bigger response. Mm, yeah. And to me, that's not real. To me, that's complete counterfeit. And what that is, that is basically saying, like, I'm an actor or an actress for hire. You guys tell me the script you want me to read and the role you want me to play and I'll play it. Yeah. And so for me, like, I don't know, man, like, I'm just me. Yeah. And my dad hung drywall like. I worked as a longshoreman. I, you know, love my wife with all my heart. I really like being a dad. I believe the whole Bible is completely true. And I believe if you don't have Jesus, you're going to hell. Like, that's just me. Yeah. And, you know, I just stay in my lane. And what's weird is people then will attack you. But if you stay in your lane, you're probably genuine. Yeah. If you turn your blinker on, you're probably a fraud. Mm. No, no, that's powerful. That's, that's, that's really good. So, um, you know, like, so I know you're a little bit disconnected from the internet and I do follow sports. Okay. Follow sports. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you're not, you're not, you're not yeah. all the way in, in yeah, the book. I follow sports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, and I'm, and lately I'm looking for a C10 or a K10 truck. So I'm doing a little bit of that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, you know, I remember there was this, uh, a very popular podcast series by this website. I think it was called like blasted me today or something like that but I'm, maybe maybe i'm getting their names a little bit incorrect and 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 it, and it was and it was about your your life and, and and some of your early ministry did you follow that at all never heard a word never heard so i don't listen to my critics yeah um not because i don't love them uh but because at the end of the day as a bible teacher if you're going to function in a prophetic way and prophetic not writing books of the bible but taking the word of God and teaching people not to just look at it, but look through it. Mm. And my view of the Bible, I'm a Bible guy. So I believe that the Bible doesn't just tell us what happened in the past, but what always happens. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to be prophetic in that, you're taking the word in the world and you're trying to connect those two so that people can interpret their experience through the word of God, you have to hear from God yeah. and listening becomes the most important thing. And it's why in the Bible, most of the time, the prophets are out in the woods a lot. Guys yeah. like John the Baptizer and Elijah, they're just in the woods. Yeah. And people are like, what are they doing? They're like, I don't even know, man. <laughs> like, um, and then they walk in and they say something and tish, Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the bomb got dropped and then they just go back in the woods. Yeah. Um, that's, that works for me. Yeah. So Thursday, uh, most weeks, Thursday and Friday, I'm literally in the mountains. I got a Bronco. I love it. Um, I used to have Jeeps and uh, I love my Bronco. Mm -hmm. And I'll go up in the mountains and I just hike. Yeah. And I turn my phone off and I think and I pray and I talk to the Lord and I listen. And I try to spend hours listening. And then I learn things yeah. and I hear things and I see things. And then I come in and I talk about them. And then people will want to talk about me. Yeah. And I don't pay any attention because I want to talk about Jesus. Yeah. And when I talk about Jesus, then Jesus gives me a platform. And then if they want to talk about me, it's so that they can get on my platform. Yeah. And if I talk about them, 
I'm inviting them onto the platform that doesn't belong to me. Yeah. The only reason I have it is to talk about Jesus. Mm. So I don't, I don't listen to my critics and I don't respond to them. Yeah. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, if they want to talk about me, I want to talk about Jesus. Yeah, no, that's good. So I try to watch episode one. It was so ridiculously biased and disgusting. I, I, I turned it off and, and, and to me, what, what I did is that whenever there's somebody that I really admire, first I try to like meet them, which obviously around the time I was like really into your content, you were way too famous for me to even remotely get to. And obviously you had, had a lot going on. So I had the privilege of like meeting a lot of pastors who would go to your church. And there was this one gentleman who told me that you baptized him, you married him. Like he was there from the very beginning, very, very kind, very kind thing. And, and what he said to me and what everyone always talked to me about was that Pastor Mark loves God. Like the, the level of respect and faithfulness that you have to your work, everybody acknowledged that. And the, and the other thing that they said was that Pastor Mark loves God, but at times he can be harsh. And so for me, like I always understood that Nehemiah prophet, because that's how I was, right? Like, that's how I was. I was this individual who, like, I yell, I'm, I'm intense, I'm, I'm passionate, you know? And so I kind of got to learn and see, like, from your experience, you know, going from the big brother to the uncle to the father, right? I got to see the transition. And so... But and I was always curious because they, you know, like they, they would say nothing but great things to you and they will they will also share that. So I was always curious that when it came to a lot of those guys who were in your church during those early days, was it primarily that maybe they were a softer generation of men and they couldn't maybe tolerate more football coach masculine style authority? Was it a little was it you were a little bit more tough and strong and heavy handed because you were younger and figuring things out or it obviously the correct answer is it's or what's this a, a combination of both those things for those guys so, so as a man just as a man all you can ever do is just work or minister or love your family out of your age and your experience mm -hmm. that's all you've got as a man and so you know when you're a young man you have a pool of experience to draw from you get older, you get a bigger pool of experience to draw from. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, for me, like I'm, I'm, when I first became a senior pastor, I wasn't even a father. Mm. Didn't even have a kid. Wow. You have a kid, you're like, oh man, I got, I got a lot to learn. Yeah. And then that, that shapes you profoundly as a man. And I think one of the most shaping things that ever happens to a man is having a daughter. Yeah. You're, I mean, you know, you're hoping for a son because you're like, mm -hmm. I think maybe I know what to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 you get a daughter, you're like, man, I got nothing. I got, I'm yeah, starting yeah, yeah, to zero here. Yeah. And then you watch your kids grow up and, and all of that shapes you as a man. And then you're with your wife years and then decades and yeah. that shapes you as a man. And so where I'm at now, like, I don't know, man, I, I uh, I'm in a different space because I'm an older man. Yeah. And what you find is when you're young as a man, you, you really need to be strong because there's not a lot of respect and honor. As you get older, um, if you're in a healthy environment, there should just be a respect for older men. Yeah. And so, um, but for me, um, I, I won't speak ill of anyone. I won't speak ill of anything. I have always just been very burdened because I continually see men going apostate. Yeah. Giving up on Christian essentials, um, and it starts with tolerating and it ends up with celebrating things that God says we should be repenting of. Mm -hmm. And there is a generational apostasy right now that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got Christians officiating same-sex marriages. You've got Christian churches that have denied historic essentials of the Christian faith, not secondary, but primary issues. Yeah. You've got the gender issue is now insane. I mean, yeah. I would have never thought in my lifetime that that I could think I was a girl and everybody else would agree with that. Yeah. That's craziness. Yeah. Or where we're now mutilating children mm. in the name of care. Yeah. Uh, California just passed a bill that unless you affirm your child's you know, gender identity at a young age, they can seize custody of the child. Mm. I mean, there was a story that blew up this week here at a university in Arizona where the nurse training uh, is saying uh, that we need to start 
teaching children about their sexual identity at age three. Mm. It's like, you don't know your alphabet, but you know your <laughs> genitalia. Yeah. Like, and so for me, it's like, how come nobody's making noise? Yeah. How come, you know, why is it that, that pastors are quiet? Yeah. They don't say anything. And if they do, they, they whisper it in the corner so that they don't get in trouble. Yeah. And so for me, I've always felt like part of my job was to be the tip of the spear yeah, and to be the guy that set uh, so that if I'm here with, you know, maybe courage or intensity or volume, and I'm not like that all the time. My kids, when I, when I took 18 months off one time and exited social media and just hung out with my family and, and healed up from some stuff. And I got a couple offers to be a reality television show. Really? Some major networks called me and wanted to follow me around. And my kids just laugh because <laughs> they're like, well, there's dad taking a nap. There's dad reading a yeah, dead yeah, Puritan. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. dad playing wiffle ball. Yeah, 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 Cause yeah, yeah. when you're in the pulpit and you're under an anointing and you're preaching to the nations, there's an anointing and an intensity there that yeah. isn't like that all week. Yeah. Um, but for me at the end of the day, it's like if, if I'm willing to live here and most guys are willing to live here, especially Christians and pastors and leaders, you know, if, if, if I can, can I pull them up to here? Yeah. Can I get them to at least go through whole books of the Bible and not skip the hard stuff? Yeah. Can I get them when it really does count to fight for the men in their church and to give them dignity, to protect women and children? Because the, the part that comes out in me, I'm a fierce defender and protector of women and children. Mm -hmm. And I see what happens when men are passive, evil men hurt women and children. Yeah. And that just bothers me at a soul level. And so for me, it's like, um, I just, I don't feel like I'm, uh, I don't feel like I'm strong. I don't feel like I'm loud. I just feel like most guys are weak and they're quiet. <laughs> oh man. So so do you mind if I share what I think? It's your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um I resonate so much with you. Right, because I resonated a lot with Dr. Peterson. Cause I cause I understand the the temperament, because my temperament's similar. It's like this fiery temperament, right? And and passion. Passion, yes, hundred percent. And what happens when you're a man who has passion? <clears throat> they think you're angry. Yeah, no, you're just passionate. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm I'm passionate about my wife. Yeah, I'm pa I'm passionate about my grandson. Yeah, um, I'm passionate about being a dad. Yeah, I'm passionate about people meeting Jesus. Yeah. I'm passionate about teaching books of the Bible. Yeah. And we just live in a world where if a man is passionate, it's like there's something wrong with him. Yeah, and it's like. No, I think the problem is if you're not passionate, you probably are not a motivated man. Yeah. And you're not a man that anybody's going to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you once said, people get in trouble for going too far, not enough people get in trouble for not going far enough. And like you said, what happens in society is that when you're a man who's passionate, like things bother you. And I think when people are not passionate, they don't they don't realize it. And I tell I tell it's a, it's a perfect <clears throat> example. Let's say you you can't stand baseball. Go to the Yankees Red Sox game, the you know, at the World Series, game seven, the pitcher for the Yankees, you know, throws a pitch, the Red Sox player hits it out the park, Red Sox win. When you're when you don't care about baseball, you feel nothing. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, what what happened? Oh, cool. But but if you're the Yankees fan and, and you're in that stadium, yeah. and and the Red Sox, you're so because you care. Yeah, the you're, dude in front of you is wearing your beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He might be a fighter too in the parking lot because of yeah. too many beers. But because when you care, you respond differently. Yeah. And so what I've always understood when there people would tell me the stories and what even from my life is I understood when a man is passionate and he cares and when you and especially it's true when you have a dad who cares for too many guys they don't have a dad who cares they, they, they have a passive Ahab type dad or absent altogether yeah and and so because he doesn't care it, he, he does there's nothing we call it the NMP mindset not my problem huh it's not my problem. The world's yeah. burning. Not my problem. My kids are going to hell. Not my problem. My wife doesn't respect me. Not my problem. They just don't care. But when you care, it's like you have this, it's not anger, it's, it's this passion. And I saw you as a man with 
with passion who was in the craziest city in America, who literally porn festivals did themes about you, who people were literally showing up to your house when your wife was home alone, who people were giving th death threats to your children, where people were simply slandering the faith and, and, and leading people in the wrong direction. And you're this one guy and of what, how else do you want him to act? Right. And I'm not making, I'm not neglecting or ignoring anyone's experience because no one's perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You don't walk on water. I don't walk on water. I'm not neglecting any of that. But to me, I, I'm always the guy that I understand the general at war is not going to be my best friend. I understand the wartime conciliary, whatever that Italian word from the, from the Godfather, Godfather. is. He's not going to be <clears throat> buddy, buddy when it's time for war. And I, and I feel like what's happened in today's society is that like you said because so many guys are raised by mom so many guys are so many raised guys are raised by screen and the screen right pacifying them video games pornography and and so when there's somebody who cares more about your life than you do now he was bullied. i'll never forget this pastor mark and i won't make this about me because i promised my wife <laughs> but i never forget uh i was doing college ministry it was the year 2012 to 2011 Got a good memory, man. <laughs> you know what? I thank you. That's that's very kind of you to say. I was doing college ministry. It was 2011. I was watching your sermons, and I was and I and 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 had a bunch of um, students that I was in charge of, and and they were just wiling out. They were just wilding, getting drunk, sleeping around, just doing all kinds of crazy things. And I remember literally going to their rooms and screaming and yelling and you know what I mean just going kind of crazy and like what's wrong with you it's not that big of a deal I said that's the problem it's your life and you're ruining it of course it's a big deal yeah. and I never forget and this always happens I'm curious how much it happens for you about 10 years later one of the guys said man Hafiz you know back in those days man I couldn't stand you you were always on my case you're always harsh you always this but man you 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 loved me you were the only one who cared you were the only one who said something everybody else let my life go to the crapper and you were the only yeah. one how often are you seeing that people are now reaching back out to you communicating like pastor mark man like i didn't see it back then but by god gosh i see it right now yeah, I mean, what's interesting, <clears throat> this last weekend, we just celebrated seven years at Trinity Church here in Scottsdale. Yeah. And uh, what's, one of the great things as a man is when you get an opportunity to take all of your experience and then start something fresh mm. based upon the experiences that you've had, good and bad. Um, you know, every guy who's been married 20 years is like, man, if I could go back and reset some stuff, <laughs> I would. Every yeah. dad who's raised a kid once, you know, the kid hits 13 years, they're like, man, if I could go back, mm -hmm. I would. Yeah. Um, God has given me this really extraordinarily uh, gift um, to, to start a church with my family and to take everything that I've learned and to try and do things with, you know, decades of, of good and bad experience mm -hmm. and, 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 and learning from the experience of others. And so where I'm at today, it's really interesting. Uh, the people that I have at Trinity Church, the uh, they're just extraordinary. Mm. Um, they listen, they love, they give, they serve, they pray, they care. And, um, and I just feel like I get to be more like a dad. Mm. And I get to be with the church more like I am with my family. Mm. Um, my, I can see it, Pastor Mark. Yeah, my my family. I mean, I'm my daughters make me cry all the time. Yeah, I mean, people are like, do you cry? Like, if you have daughters, you you can cry a lot. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> and it's not so for me. Grace and I were talking about it yesterday. She usually cries when she's sad. I cry out of joy. Mm. So I, and you know, and so for me, it's my daughters and my grandkids and people meeting Jesus. Yeah, I am very passionate, and it means a lot to me. Um, and so it's in this really wonderful season to where it's like, it is really devastating. It's very, one of the most devastating things of, of just ministry is 
you have a front row seat to watch people self-destruct. Mm. And it's, and it's almost like they, they're an arsonist that set their house on fire and they're burning and you're outside yelling like, jump out the window, jump <laughs> yeah, out the yeah, window. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Why are you yelling at me? Like, jump out the yeah, window. Yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. I love you. I care about you. You're, you're, you've set your life on fire. You're hurting yourself. And if you're a man, you've probably got a wife and kids and other people that are going to suffer with you. Mm. And, but I, I'm at this season now where, um, I have a level of respect and authority that the Holy Spirit has given me that I don't fully understand and truly don't deserve that people listen to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think once people know that you deeply, profoundly love them and that you have their best interest at heart and that you are trying to cause their life to be the best for them that it possibly can be, I think their ears open up. Mm. And I think the older you get, the more you're about, um, you know, making sure that the people know that you care about them so that when you speak to them, um, there's not as much resistance. Mm. And because we're sinners and fools and we do stupid things, we've all got our resistance. But, um, you know, the older you get as a man, you realize that, uh, that your hammer's a Thor hammer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if somebody loves you and trusts you, you wield a lot more authority and you come with a lot more force than you anticipate. Mm. Yeah. No, that's, and when you're a young man, yeah. you don't know that because yeah. you're like, nobody listens to me, so I got to dial it up to 10. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But when you're an older guy. Yeah, that's good, Pastor Mark. When you're an older guy, it's like, you know what? I, I, I carry a Thor hammer. I, I'll never forget um, when my... When my uh, my oldest daughter was little. She was the compliant, obedient, good kid. And she was little. And she did something wrong, which she hardly ever did anything wrong. She's a very good girl. I'll never forget. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't yell. I'm the dad that hugs his kids, kisses his kids on the head, tells them he loves them. I'm super the yes affectionate dad. dad. I'm the yes dad. Yeah. I'm the party planner dad. Yeah. But I'll never forget. I looked at her and I just said her name. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't say it harsh. I just, and, and she threw up. Oh, wow. Just knowing that I was disappointed. Mm, yeah. I was like, I didn't know I had that superpower. <laughs> and my son, it didn't work like that. <laughs> Did not work like that. Yeah. Um, but part of it is as a man, it's like, who knows that I love them and who knows that I care about them. I need to be very careful that my words um, build them up, don't break them down. Mm. And 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 when you're a younger man, you don't understand that. Yeah. And and that's why and part of it too. That maybe I don't know if you want to get into this, but like, please. When younger men are having conflict, like it's brothers. Yeah. But it's totally different when there's a conflict between a father and a son. Mm. Yeah. So like, if you grew up with a brother, you like he could just walk in and jump your brother and assault him. Yeah, yeah. But if your dad did that, you'd remember that for the rest of your oh, life. Oh, yes. Now we're talking, Pastor Mark. And so, you know, today, now I'm like, I'm a father. Yeah. And yeah. spiritually, I'm a father. Yeah, this is good. And I want to make sure that um, that I become the person that my family and my flock need. Yeah. And usually as a man, it's like, well, this is who I am. It's like, no, once you're a father, you're like, I need to be who my mm. wife needs. I need wow, to be so good. who my kids need. I need to be who my flock needs. Yeah. Uh, and it's not about me. It's about them. Yeah. And it needs, I need to adjust and lead in whatever way yeah. is best for them. And mm. so um, I'm really enjoying, this is actually my favorite season of my life. I can see it. This is the best season yeah. of my life. Um, you leaned up even more. What's that? You feel like you leaned up a little bit as well. I don't know what that means. Like I got smaller, like like lost some weight. Oh yeah, no, uh, yeah, no. I mean, when you get older, bro, if you put on weight, it doesn't get better. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. get better. Yeah, I don't want to be one of those guys who like if I drop something, I got to order another one on Amazon because I can't get down and back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm healthy. Yeah, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, spiritually healthy. Um, I would say most of my emotional life right now is gratitude and joy yeah that's beautiful and uh I, I married the greatest girl in the history of the world yeah i love my kids and they still are there yeah. and they love jesus and uh they're willing to have me involved in their life mm. and now they're 
bring in people home they want to marry and they're awesome people that's beautiful and they're having grandkids and uh you know i got little guys and yeah. pretty soon my hikes you know will probably be with my grandsons yeah that's and awesome. take them fishing and, and take them out in the woods and so for me it's like uh so much of a young man is just striving yeah and uh and then you reach a season where you don't have anything to prove and mm. you don't have anyone to impress. Mm. You just know that you're the father's son. And like, uh, like at Jesus baptism is one of the most amazing statements in the scriptures. Uh, G- the father looks down at Jesus at the baptism and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah. And at that point he hadn't performed a miracle. He hadn't yep. preached a sermon. He hadn't cast out a demon. Mm. And I just feel like the father loves me and I'm his son. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not because I'm a like a great son, <laughs> yeah. but I have a great father. Yeah. And the more I live in that place of sonship and he teaches me how to be a father at home and at church, I don't know. I just find that life flows in the spirit in a beautiful yeah. way. And, um, and, and I really, um, I'm grateful for everyone I've gotten to baptize. I'm grateful for every sermon I've gotten to preach. I'm grateful for everything I've gotten to do. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for all the sins I've been forgiven of. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful that, um, that I just get to enjoy my life Mm. and I get to enjoy it with people I love and I get to do what I love. And I think for a man, I think the main thing is just find God's will and live in it Yeah. and be content Mm. and then enjoy the people and things as they come without this striving ambition to double down and potentially risk everything to have a little more. Mm. And that's just where I'm at. Like I'm, I'm having a good day every day. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. No, I can like pass the mark. I think, like I said to me, I don't know you personally. All I know you from a TV screen. So you're a lot taller than you were on, I know. on my TV I screen. I had a girl from Ukraine come this week <laughs> to get baptized. Yeah. And she came up to me, she was crying. I gave her a hug and yeah. she was super sweet. She's like, I thought you'd be taller. I was yeah. like, me too. <laughs> I mean, I'm still waiting for a growth yeah, spurt, man. Yeah. I'm taking my gummy yeah. vitamins every morning. I'm hoping. Yeah. So, so to me, now nah, this is this is this is this is so much so much good stuff. Question for after all these years of ministry, how different is or are men today from when they were in '96? Would you say men have become worse? Have do you think it's been stagnant? What what would you say is the difference between men when you started ministry and how men are today? Um, men grew up, young men today grew up in an environment that maliciously broke them. Mm. And so you can look at men and be like. Why are you not working? Why are you not launching? Why are you not leading? Why are you not marrying? Why are you not fathering? Or you can ask, what environment did, because every man today, here's how I see it. Every man today was a little boy. Mm. And what did we do with and to and for that little boy? Mm. Because we live in a world, I always say, there's a national organization for women, there's not a national organization for men. Yeah. Uh, You can go get a women's studies degree. You can't get a men's studies degree. Um, And and, and we we created an environment where we said, you know, fathers are dispensable and disposable. um, And governments are perfectly qualified to educate and raise children. And so what we're looking at is a whole generation that, quite frankly, was a lab rat for a social experiment. Mm. What if we give them a screen? What if we give them pornography? What if we give them legalized drugs and vaping? What if we took away their father? What if we took away their faith? Mm. Um, what if we um, had them and their mother dependent on the government? And, and, and let's just see what happens. Yeah. Well, those guys grow up um, broken. Mm. And so you're seeing mental health, suicidal ideation, depression. And you could look at those guys and say, you know, you're not much of a man. Or you could say, I'm sorry for the system that you grew up in. Mm. To me, it's almost like a child that grows up in an abusive, traumatic environment. Yeah. You could look at them as an adult and say, why are you so broken? Or you can say, this system is broken and it broke you. Mm. Nah, that's that's good. So, you know, there was a study, too, that came out recently for the first time since the 1970s in this sociological data study. Uh, Twelfth grade boys are conservative. 
Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Girls are still liberal. Yeah. Progressivism is just built on telling stories to manipulate emotions. Yeah. So it tends to work more for women than men. Mm-hmm. Um, but the young men have reached the conclusion like, this ain't working. Yeah. This ain't working. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've had enough of pronouns and gender and genitalia and dependency and government and addiction and spectrum, you know, like enough. Yeah. And to me, it's when a whole generation of young men, two things happen. They get angry and then they get active. Mm. But you don't get active until you get angry. Mm. And and then the key is, where are the fathers that are going to help those angry young men get active in a healthy way. Yeah. And you're seeing the Andrew Tates, you're seeing the Jordan Petersons, you're seeing the Joe Rogans, you're seeing certain guys are getting uh, the ear of primarily younger men. But, you know, Paul says it this way. He says, you have many teachers, you don't have many fathers. Mm. And so at the end of the day, you know, what we really need is a generation of older men yeah. who have a father's heart that say, hey, I want to I wanna help build up and pull up the young guys. Yeah. And honestly, that's what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, that's my thing. I believe that's what God called me to. I believe that God, I mean, God has prophesied that over my life. Yeah. Um, Pastor Jimmy Evans, uh, one of my pastors, I didn't really know him. I was at a conference, like 4,000 pastors, and uh, I resigned my job and took a break and I was at this conference and I was supposed to speak and I didn't want to speak. So I didn't just cause I wasn't in a good headspace and I, I didn't want to say anything. I regret when you're under pressure, just shut up, you know, <laughs> and then get your head on straight. Learn that the hard way. Yeah. And he got up and he said, before I speak, I got a prophetic word for pastor Mark. So he asked me to stand. I'm like, I don't need a prophetic word from a total stranger, <laughs> yeah. you know, live streamed on the internet <laughs> with 4,000 pastors yeah, in the yeah, room. Yeah. And he prophesied and he said, uh, you did ministry as a brother, I'm paraphrasing. He said, you're going to return as a father. Mm. And he said, you're going you're gonna to have the greatest influence of your life. Yeah. And I think I'm starting to walk into that. And yeah. so for me, like um, a brother wakes up every day and thinks about himself. Um, a father wakes up every day and thinks about his son. Mm. Man. And so for me, it's like, how can I help? How can I serve? How can I encourage? I've got three sons. I love them with all my heart. I've got a great son-in-law. Uh, I got men in my church that I love and I care about. And uh, I just feel like, you know, if we want young men to be better men, we need older men to be better fathers. Yeah. Pastor Mark, so to me, I I judge people by a myriad of things and I'm I like judging the healthiest way. And there's and there's things about you, same with my dad, like what I love about my dad the most is that he like he's he looks at me like I'm like three years old when he when I when I come home, <laughs> like like yeah. like the joy. I remember you would always tell this story and 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 I remember this story. But you would talk about when you're a dad, and then you come home, and your kids just run up to you and there's so much joy and you're so happy. I remember you telling those stories. I remember my dad when I, when me and my siblings would run home, yeah. the joy in his eyes. So my dad looks at me that same way in my 30s as when I was three. So it's consistent faithfulness. You, since, like I said, me, I started watching you at 19, you were doing this, like I said, even when I was in freaking elementary school, right? Consistent faithfulness. You are helping men through and through. And what I saw around 2008 and 2000, uh, 2009, 2012, helping men was in, it was trendy. It was a thing to do. Manhood, masculinity, man up, da 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 da. It was a thing kind of in that reform movement, right? And then it died. And then it kind of dissipated. And then it became whatever new trendy thing that the church is obsessed with nowadays. And so my my biggest thing is that I remember one time I interviewed a pastor, uh, a very famous mega church in Houston. And I, and I told him, I was like, so my question to you is like, why does your, why does your church have like, you know, 75% women and 25% men? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, why is your demographic 75, 25? And he's like, I never knew that. And I was like, what do you mean? Hmm. He's like, oh, I, I, I never noticed that. I said, 
in my brain, I was like, how do you, you are the pastor of this giant mega church. How do you not know that 75% of your attendees are women and 25% are men? So you are a guy who's, this has been your life for 30 plus years. And I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy who's always telling the church what it's doing wrong and treating the church like a pinata. I don't want to be that guy. I want it to be this conversation. But my question to you is why is there not more guys like you were saying who are putting their arms around men? There's like, I'm, I'm like, why are guys and pastors, why are they not doing it? And then they're leaving the world to do it. And like these mercenary type guys are just teaching complete garbage to these kids. Why is that not? something that other pastors like you are passionate about why did they not even see it's a problem i have no idea i mean to me um if we lose the men we lose everything and if we don't get anything but the men the men will get the rest mm. so you know like to me like i do real men it's my weekly men's Bible study. I'll teach it tonight. And, you know, I just tell myself, we build men up to bless women and children. Yeah. The goal is not just to build men up, but to bless women and children until the wives are like, my husband's better. Yeah. And the kids are like, my dad's better until we're there. That's not, you know, we're not doing our job. That's why the Andrew Tates and stuff, they're like, we build men up, but are they blessing women and children? And are they honoring God? Mm. And so there, you, you're not a, you're not a grown man until you're living for God and others. Mm. If all you are is living for yourself, you're still a selfish little boy. And so I, I don't understand. I mean, today, right now, like the first thing that are from, from the government to the church, to the school system, the first thing that should be happening is how do we raise men up mm -hmm. to bless women and children? Yeah. Cause if you do that, you'll get rid of poverty. Statistically, you'll get rid of it. You will create generational wealth. You will get rid of women who are sexually assaulted, abused. You'll eliminate most of sex trafficking. Um, statistically, you'll get rid of uh, drug addiction if there's a father in the home. I mean, most of our social problems yeah. will go away. Mm -hmm. And so like even at Trinity Church, which is a beautiful, wonderful church that gives me the honor of being the pastor, um, it is men. Yeah. And it's great men. I mean, I was just up in the mountains with our table leads for our men's ministry. And these are the guys that like, if, if something happened to me, my sons could just call one of them mm. and get wise counsel and a spiritual father. Yeah. These are the kinds of men that now that my grandsons are being born, I really want my grandsons to draft behind these men. Mm. And so I think the church has this unique opportunity because there's nowhere else in the culture yeah. that is welcoming men and has something positive to build them. Yeah. And so the church is all we've got, but yeah. praise God. I mean, it's an incredible opportunity. Like most churches have got a great children's ministry and a great women's ministry and a great student ministry, all of which I'm for. Mm -hmm. But like if we had better husbands and fathers, we, yeah. we probably, kids ministry would be the backup. Women's ministry would be for her to get friends, not for her to have somebody to pray with and walk mm. with because her husband would be her friend. Yeah student ministry, the student director would be going after the lost kids because the dads had already be walking with the found kids. Mm. And so, yeah, to me, I mean, um, our church is an experiment in what this looks like. And early return on investment is really good. And so for me, like, I, um, I don't do men's ministry because it works. I do men's ministry because I love the men. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, it, yeah. and, and, it, and what happens is, how many guys have ever had, you know, anyone, let alone a pastor say, I love you. Yeah. I believe in you. I tell my guys all the time, like you matter, your marriage matters, your kids matter, your job matters. I'm here every yeah. week because you're important to me. Yeah. And for most men, they're like, nobody's ever said that. Right. Cause all the government wants to do is just tax you and blame you. And then all the church wants to do is just get you to tithe and uh, drop your kids off, mm. you know? And it's like, no, I mean, what would it look like if we actually started where God started with men? Mm. You know, God started human history with a man. God came into human history as a man. Yeah. And we're not against women and children, but what we're saying is the best thing we can do for women and children is have better men. Yeah.
Now that's powerful. I remember you you mentioned that point, and it was so funny because when I was a teacher, my 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 students, I would always tell them, "Hey, I love you. I'm proud of you." Uh, and literally now, decade later, they they remember that because totally. to your point, if no one in your life ever told you I love you, you're gonna remember the one person who did, 100%. right? So I really, I always appreciate that style that you you always, always spoke life into men. So my my other question is that one of the things I've been noticing as well on the internet, and like I said, you're not as much on the internet, but I think you have a good awareness of the culture. I think you've always been a great cultural analysis. What is that, like a soci- sociologist? Is that is that what it yeah, was? Yeah, the Christian perspective would be the missiologist. Missiologist, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I I think that was what I've always loved about you. You were always knowing like psychology, and I learned about Alfred Kinsey through you. Like you were always very uh, uh, astute on the cultural teachings that are poisoning the minds of the people. And so one of the things that I've noticed that's been my biggest anger and frustration is that you have like these internet men who are now demonizing and poisoning the well of marriage for a new generation of men 40 percent of millennials latest statistic don't believe in marriage they think it's an outdated institution yeah and so in the past i remember like i said like 20 years ago it was like the feminist types who were like demonizing marriage and telling women not to get married and to being 45 and sex in the city lifestyle and being single was a thing but now we're seeing like these men are now poisoning the well teaching men that marriage is a waste of time it's nothing but exploitation literally the feminist but men version of it so so what is your message to men who have been hearing all these unhealthy messages about marriage and, and now are very discouraged and think it's just a woman's going to divorce you and steal your kids? What What is your message to those guys who've been filled with messages from men who are anti-marriage? So um, the second most important decision you make, this is what I tell my sons, is who you marry. Most important decision you make is who's your God. Mm-hmm. Your God and your wife. You get those two straight your life is probably going to end pretty good. You get either one of those wrong and uh, there's a mushroom cloud over your life (laughs) down the horizon. You know, it's going to blow up. And um, the reason that many men, young men struggle with marriage, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Some, they didn't grow up with a father in the home, so they've not had a a model of marriage. Two, their dad abandoned them and left. And so they have a father wound and they have a, they have a, they have, they have a negative or, or fear of marriage. Like, they have an interest in it, but they're terrified of it. Mm. For other men, um, they're just lazy and selfish. Mm. They're like, you know what? Um, I don't want to do that much work, and I don't want to have that much commitment, and I don't want to take on that much responsibility. And so there's there's a myriad of reasons. But at the end of the day, most young men are part of a massive social experiment that is not going to end well, mm. you know? And so historically, how have civil, how have civilizations flourished? It's easy. Young men go through a rite of passage and they're told you're not a boy, you're a man. Then they're then expected to take on masculine responsibilities like marriage and parenting and work and service of others and care for, you know, the culture. And, uh, and, and our culture decided, let's just Let's do everything opposite. Mm. Let's make boys girls. Let's make uh, marriage bad. Let's make sex easily available. Uh, let's make um, women breadwinners so that men can be dependent um, and act like children and, mm. and literally have their girlfriends or their wives be like their mothers. Mm. And then let's see what happens. Yeah. And for the guys that are like, yeah, that's what I think. Well, then you're an idiot. (laughs) And, you know, this would be the equivalent of taking a health class and they're saying, here's what you need to do. You need to eat your feces and drink your urine. (laughs) And a guy going, well, that's what I'm going to do because that's what they said. Mm. I'm just telling you, you're going to be sick (laughs) and you're going to die. And so, you know, I believe that that this world is filled with evil. I believe it's filled with demons. I believe it's filled with lies. Mm. And if you're not a discerning man... Uh, you're a target. Mm. How, for guys who don't even understand that concept of discernment, like the guys who literally are watching these videos and they believe, oh, this guy sounds smart. Marriage doesn't work. Oh, this the the the, the pseudo science he's spewing out with these data points makes sense. What what is your message to guys who lack discernment in that area? Find a man that is honorable and respectful and older, and. Uh, dial down everything else you're listening to and dial up the voice of that man. Yeah. 
So find a guy who's down the road and be like, okay, that, that looks good. Mm. Like if his wife is smiling <laughs> and his kids love him and you know, he's had some measure of success in business or something of that nature. To me, you know, most guys are listening to people that have theory, but no results. Mm. You know, and so, I mean, most of the influencers and most of the internet is just phone sex. Everybody's talking, but nothing's happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just yeah. a lot of opinions. Like, yeah. find somebody that did something. Yeah. You know, and so, because um, for me, like, I've been, I've been faithfully married to my wife for 31 years. We dated four and a half years before we were married. Uh, March 12th, 1988. I uh, went on my first date at 17 with Grace. Um, being married is the hardest thing you'll ever do because it exposes all of your selfishness, all of your insecurities, and you can't hide who you really are mm -hmm. in marriage. You can, you can hide who you are almost everywhere, yeah. but who you truly are is who you are at home with your wife, when nobody's looking mm. and your wife is like a mirror and a lot of guys don't want to get married because they don't want to see who they are mm. man i think the thing that you brought up and i tell guys similar things i said hey my class closing message to all the guys that were that were ever listened to me is find a person in real life yeah, find a human being that's yeah. done something. Yeah. I mean, to me, because because here's the deal: like, communism works on paper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we keep trying it, and it doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> but it works on paper. Yeah, everything works on paper. Yeah, you know, find me somebody who's actually field tested their life, and has produced fruit and results. Yeah, you know, and again, it's like so. At the end of the day, what really matters is not what your performance review says, what your GPA says, what your social media followers say. Uh, at the end of the day, what really matters is who your wife and kids think you are. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's who you are. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, um, if you find a man whose wife and kids respect and enjoy and appreciate and honor him, you should listen to that guy. Yeah. You know, and I've been doing this long enough. There's a lot of people that go up. There's not a lot that stay up. Mm. You know, there's guys that every band's got one song that's a hit. And yeah. Every author's got, you know, one book that trends and every social media influencer's got, you know, one clip that goes viral. It's not going up. It's staying up. Mm. And it's faithfulness. It's what Eugene Peterson called long obedience in the same direction. Um, find a guy who's like, man, he, he slugged out his career. He loved yeah. his wife. He, he loved his kids. He wasn't perfect, man. He'll be the first one to tell you his, his failures. Of course. Um, but at the end of the day, the people that are closest to him are better because yeah. he was in their life. Yeah. That's the mark of a good man. Yeah. And I, I talk about this idea of like, I have a hall of fame. And people are like, oh, what, what, what do you mean by Hall of Fame? Like, like Hall of Fame is like my favorite people of all time. And I said there's three qualifications, actually five, but I'll focus on three today. Love by wife, admired by children, successful in career. The world will worship you as long as you're successful in your career. Mm -hmm. but, to, but to have your career, your children, and your wife sing praises and the minimum to get into the Hall of Fame is 25 years. You have to do it for 25 years. There's, there's no early ballots. There's none of 25 mm -hmm. year minimum, which is which is why I love you so much. And the thing, Pastor Mark, that I'm I'm so obsessed with nowadays is how so many bad ideas are in society. We can go on for days for all the bad ideas. And some of the bad ideas are just so ridiculous, but it deters people from doing what's right. And one of the things I loved was that like seeing your your children grow up all of them love the love god all of them love each other all of them love you 
And it's so it's such a lie that, oh, the Christian kids are going to go to college and wild out. The, the Christian girls are going to be the craziest girls. They're going to do this down in the third. But like looking at your life and all the other godly men that have been in my life, I'm seeing children who are in love with their family, in love with their God and in love with their father. Obviously, all things good come from above. You know that, Pastor Mark. What is it that you feel like you did for men who want to be uh, have a legacy of a father like you did? What is those things that you did that made your family so intimately in love with you through all the years? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe this would be a good place to, to wrap it up. But like, there's just... I talk a lot about uh, ministry of presence and uh, you know, God didn't just look at the world and send a book. He came down and he was with us. That's, mm -hmm. that's Jesus. So it's the ministry of presence. Yeah. And a lot of life is just the ministry of presence. It's being there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times guys will be like, you need to be there for the big days. You're like, well, the truth is in life, Sometimes it's the little days that become the big days and the little moments that become the memories. Mm. And so, you know, I, one of my regrets is when I, when my children were younger, I, I was present. I was at the baseball games and I was at home for dinner and I was there for family movie night and I was there, but sometimes I wasn't mentally there. Mm. I was thinking about work or distracted or ambitious for something I was working on. I may have even been physically present, but I wasn't emotionally, spiritually, mentally present. And now with technology, you can be physically present and completely absent, just mm. constantly distracted. That's good. And what I find when you're raising kids is um, it's that ministry of presence. Mm -hmm. And and I like to be present. I'm a guy who um, I need my wife and kids. If I didn't have a wife and kids and a flock, I would not be a healthy man. Mm. And I'm not saying I'm the healthiest man in the world, but it'd be worse. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just being there when, you know, your son walks in, I work at home. I used to, I've always worked from home as you do at my library at home. Son comes in, he's like, dad, I want to play wiffle ball. I'm here. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm not working on Colossians anymore. I'm working on curveballs. That's yeah. what I'm doing today. And I'll never forget, like there was a, my daughter, she uh, she ran track. She's super great sprinter, and she got injured and she couldn't run for a while. And so then she'd recovered and she was coming back. And she uh, had a tournament. It was a long drive and then a ferry ride and then another long drive. It was like hours to get to. It was raining. It was cold. She was only going to run one race, just the hundred, because she was returning. Mm -hmm. So what is that like? I don't. I don't remember the times. Like thirteen seconds yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. You know, like thirteen seconds. Like. Okay, so to go there, to wait, to come back, like I got to blow like three or four hours mm. for 13 seconds. Mm. And she was like, Daddy, don't come. You don't need to come. You don't need to come. And I was, so I said, okay, honey, I won't come. Well, of course I'm going to come. So I got there and I sat, I, I positioned myself at the finish line. My daughter ran through. She looked over because mm. she was wondering if I was going to be there. Mm. And I was there. Yeah. She came over. She said, Daddy, you didn't need to come. I was like, no, I did, honey. She's like, but you took a whole day for 13 seconds. I was like, yeah, but I will give up a whole day yeah. to make a memory in 13 seconds yeah. with my daughter. Because not so that I can be a good dad, but because I believe um, we both need that. Mm. And it's just being present. Yeah. And a lot of times guys are like, what do you say? What do you do? Sometimes it's just showing up. Yeah. It's like dad was at the dining room table yeah. and he turned his phone off. And as, as weird as it sounds, there's a lot of kids that if those two things happened, their mm. life would change. If dad was at the dining room table with his phone off, their life would change. Mm. It's not as complicated and it's usually not a, a big thing. It's like a thousand very little moments that aren't missed. Mm. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Pastor Mark, man, it's been many years to come to this point. Um, I've been through many difficulties as you have as well. No, nowhere close to what you've been through. But everything that you went through is made for this moment to transform the lives of men. 
before you close with your closing message, can you can you let the people know about? We should have touched your books, but can you let people know yeah. about the, your books as well? Yeah, I'm supposed to tell them this. Uh, when your war is a book I wrote with my wife, and it's on spiritual warfare and why culture is the way it is, and and even for those who don't know the the God of the Bible, it's a, it's a, is there evil and is it at work in our world? And if so, how is it playing itself out? And so we'll give them a free copy if they go to realfaith.com slash the roommates. Um, we'll send them a free digital copy. And I just like to give Bible teaching away. So if anybody wants it, that's great. I love it. And in, 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 in closing, is there a message you want to leave the young men who are, who are watching this video that you want them to take away from this conversation? Um, you need to figure out who you think Jesus Christ is. Mm. And until you figure out who Jesus Christ is, you won't figure anything out. Mm. And once you figure out who Jesus Christ is, he'll help you figure everything else out. Mm. Gentlemen, man, I, I hope that you are blessed as much as I've been blessed by sitting next to Pastor Mark. My biggest piece of advice is one of two things. First, you got to make sure you follow Pastor Mark. Um, follow him on YouTube. Um, make sure you're looking up Real Faith Ministries, checking out all this content. But more than that, find a man like this in person who can continue to speak into your life because this is where true transformation happens, having older, godly, seasoned men to give you the wisdom. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you guys so much for your energy. And I pray that you do not miss out on all these amazing words spoken to you. My name is Hafiz, and I'm joined by... Pastor Mark. Thanks, brother. Thank you, guys, and have a great day.